Welcome back, duelists, and today we've got another meta tier list. We are a single week away now from the North American World Championship Qualifier and only two weeks away from the European Championship. So, it's going to be an interesting two weeks as we finally get to see who qualifies for Worlds. And if you're trying to compete yourself, then this is where you want to be, as we'll go over what the best staples are going to be for your main deck and side deck for the upcoming format. I've split up this tier list into five categories. The best main deck staples, the best side deck staples, playable main deck staples, playable side staples, and then poor choices, cards that I wouldn't put anywhere in your deck list. And the way you get works, there's going to be a degree of mixing. Some cards can work only in some decks and will earn their spot some places. And in some cases, the card will be a main deck card in some decks and a side deck card in other decks. So watch closely for my explanations on each card as I can give you a more detailed and thorough reasoning behind each of my choices. That being said, if you enjoy these types of videos where I give you guys a tier list on the best decks in the meta and then also the best staples in the meta, then please consider liking, subscribing, leaving a comment down below if this is worthwhile for me doing, as well as if you have anything that you felt like I missed or judged inappropriately, then leave your feedback and I can maybe give you my thoughts. Now, so anyways, this is going to be a long one, so let's get straight into it. The first things to go over are hand traps, the most common place of staples in the current metagame, and they happen for quite a while. Ever since the onset of Snake Eyes, it's been almost undebatable that hand traps are superior to board breakers. Now, in recent times, we are seeing a little more pickup in board breakers because the combo for Snake Eye has gotten weaker. However, Infinite Forbidden does change that. Now, there's plenty of stuff to talk about for Infinite Forbidden changing the format, but the Fiend Smiths are absolutely the biggest difference. Now that we also know the TCD exclusives, we know that Necro Princess makes a difference as well for the ability of Snake Eyes to expand upon their combos. But the weird thing with the Fiendsmith cards is it doesn't make it better into either hand traps or board breakers. The best decks like Snake or Ubel, in fact, get better into both. It's kind of toxic because Fiendsmith allows you to make a better board using cards like Desi Ray to negate cards like Dark Ruler if you compare it with any sort of chainable spell or trap. Or you can just have the extra negate up, which is in place of like a Baron or a Savage is very strong. You're still gonna have the IP Flame Burge Apo Omni negate like uh, yeah, that's great. This a Princess and Grave as well. Why not throw that on top as well? And if your goal is to hand trap them, well, for one, they got a better extender. But now, like, with Closed Moon being announced in the set and Necro Quip Princess, you can turn your bodies way more efficiently into something else. So with that being said, how do hand traps fall up in the current metagame? Well, I think it's still mostly the same. The best main deck staples are all hand traps. Every single one of them. The best one is one that only some decks can play, but if you can, it is a non-negotiable, it should be in your main deck, and that is Dimension Shifter. One of the most absolutely powerful cards of all time, even, you can argue. Uh, it's just not usable in every deck. I'll, I'll be hard-pressed to find a format where this card is both legal and not at the top of the best main deck staple section. That being said, if you can't fit it in, then yeah, don't fit it in. But even decks that are like only okay when Shifter resolves, like Pearly or Tempai, are encouraged to play this card because it is so overbearing against decks that require the graveyard that there's not much recourse for it. I mean, you've seen me complain about Lingering Floodgates for a reason. This card is broken. But I'm not going to ramble on about a card that has been broken for the last several years. There are also five other cards that I consider best main deck staples, and they're all hand traps. Four of those are pretty much the same as last time. First up, let's talk about the Effect Negation Hand Traps, Infinite Impermanence and Effect Veiler. Both are absolute killers because they are some of the only chance you have at stopping a Snake Eye opponent on their tracks in the first play. That being said, you can push through it now with more extenders thanks to Fiendsmiths. But also with the Fiendsmith cards, now you have the ability to make any Link 2 and with the Fiendsmith engine. The Fiendsmith engine can then turn into Rank 6s or give the bodies to extend past Veiler into Promethean Princess, revive Snake Eye Ash so it's reset off the Effect Negator, uh, and then use the second effect of it to still progress your combos. So all that in mind, you really can do quite a lot even though you get Veiler. However, that being said, if we decide that the way to approach this is still going to be only hand trap based, then effect Veiler and Impermanence are still great because they are some of the best hand traps to pair with other things. So I do think it is still some of the best hand traps in the game, although they did probably get a bit worse relative to the other hand traps in the tier list. Next up is Ash Blossom and Joy Spring. This card I feel like has gotten better since the last tier list. Now, in past tier lists, I've been debating if this card deserved the main deck spot, and there were times in Snake Eye where I thought this card may have not deserved a main deck spot, even in the mirror match, partially because it's a liability when your opponent ashes you and they have a fire in the grave. But now we've advanced the combo so much that key different extra body really isn't even that much of a trade up than just going for the Fiendsmith combo, but also the Fiendsmith cards are weaker to Ash because going Requiem 
or turning two bodies into a closed moon, then sacking it off is pretty weak into Ash. Uh, and Ash is also one of the best hand traps to pair. So as we're deciding that we need several hand traps to stop Snake Eye now and really leaning into the fact that we're pairing hand traps, the ones that were exceptional when paired, like Ash Blossom, start to shine a bit more. Ash also works in a better way because Yubel is a deck. Now, Yubel is a popular deck, uh, and one of the only spots that Yubel can lose to a single hand trap when its hand is just okay is on some Sarah de Lotus. Ashing it there is one of the best ways to end their turn. There are also some hands where Ashing on Nightmare Pain or Nightmare Throne can end the turn, so Ash can get there almost the same way Valor or Imperm would versus the old Snake Eye decks. Although it is easier for Yubel to push through Valor and Imperm than it is Ash Blossom. So a bit of a, a, a switch up there from what Snake Eyes used to. And then the other thing is if there is going to be an uptick in Tenpai, Ash is by far and away the better card in that matchup. In fact, it is straight up good in the matchup and Imperm and Valor are just strictly bad in that matchup. Now, next up is one that I actually feel like may have moved to the top position. And that will partially be parts because now we are relying on pairing hand traps together in order to be effective. And that is Nibiru the Primal Being. It pairs absolutely fantastic with pretty much uh, anything else. And thanks to that, it's now probably the best hand trap. Like I want to see Nibiru in my hand as much as possible. However, if your goal is to draw one hand trap and think you have a chance in hell versus Yubel or Snake Eye, you're dreaming. Now, Yubel will have a bit of an easier time putting up several negates and insulating through Nibiru. But if you are able to time it decently off, you can still stop them from making a huge field. So yeah, those are the four main hand traps that I said are best main staples. But there was one more I mentioned. And uh, what is it? Well, it's one that really hasn't been in the main deck for a while. However, saw some consideration in the, in the middle of last format or around April. And that is Bestial Magnemut. As Fiendsmith is going to dominate the meta as the engine for pretty much any deck that has uh, access to free bodies, Bestials now have extra efficacy because they answer Fiendsmiths to some degree, at least. Uh, and they cut off resources at the same time. So it's going to be giving you the body, uh, stopping them from, from playing, and also meaning they don't have the grind game access with the Fiendsmith cards that they would have uh, if you had, like, Ghost Belted. it. I think Magnemot's the only one that's absolutely extraordinary because it gives you that plus one as well. Dwarf Swarm and Bulldrake are solid cards, but there is a clear difference in card quality when you draw Magnemot versus Dwarf Swarm. And if you look at a lot of OCG deck lists, you can see this almost present, where a lot of decks have started to play one Magnemot and then either one Dwarf Swarm or one Bulldrake. And the principle is clear. The Bistrals are solid, and Magnemot specifically is a very powerful card to draw. Uh, and it's good in several matchups. Now, Yubel as well is another deck that is light and dark based, where Bistrals can be effective. They're not in killer versus the deck. They're not going to end the game the same way sometimes a Bistral can versus Tier, but you can cut off the flow of resources, cut off access to Yubel cards, and therefore sometimes Phantom of Chaos. You could hit a Yama Engrave or a Rage Engrave to break fields. And they can also apply pressure in the battle phase to attack over cards like Rage if there isn't a Yama or they only have one that you can manage. Uh, it's typically been a very good card versus that Unchained type field, so unless it's a Caesar, that still remains true. On top of that, with Fiendsmith now existing, we now have a better use for the body to generate with the Bestials. Before, if you were playing, say, a Snake Eye deck and you were trying to summon Bestials uh, to stop their IP play, then what would you do with the, with the body you summoned? You can make Charmers, or you can turn that plus a Snake Eye plus another body into Princess. And while those are okay uses for it, there is no doubt it is clearly a less impactful player than making your Link to Light Fiend. Now, it also interestingly has the level 6 stat line, which means that it can combo with the Fiendsmith cards to go into cards like Beatrice or into Constellage Hollow M7. Both of which may already be in your deck because of Fiendsmith synergies, where before you wouldn't have considered them, now you have extra utility for the Bistrals that didn't exist. So I would be looking forward to seeing how many Bistrals are being played in main decks and side decks within the next format. Anyways, let's talk about uh, other hand traps that aren't here on the list. So playable main deck staples in the hand trap department, I think you have a couple. Jewish Swarm and Baldrake would fall here on the list. They aren't nearly as powerful as uh, Magnemut. And obviously, if you're playing Magnemut, you will have to play one of these as well, and most likely. Now, there is a world where you need extra hand traps, and you play more Bistrals. If you have the space for more hand traps, then these playable main deck uh, hand traps and staples are going to be slotted in in those spare spots. Because uh, as I said, you're trying to pair multiples together, then those first few hand traps I mentioned as the best staples aren't going to cut it, and you're going to need all that space in the world. That is why decks like Snake Eye and Tempai and Yubel are going to be success. They Use strong combos, be resilient to hand traps, and play those cards. Now, I've been liking them in the main. I think they are pretty good against Fiendsmiths. They have playability for Snake Eyes. They're good versus U Bell. And I think they will do pretty decent in the upcoming formats. But let me move on from Mistrals. Uh, Ghost Mourner and Ghost Ogre. Two options that I feel like are just okay. But uh, if you need more hand traps, can be solid fits. Ghost Ogre is a weirder one. 
Uh, it's a card that I typically hate, and it's absolutely abysmal by itself. Sometimes in grind games, cards like Nibiru can get there. Uh, Ogre, I feel like, not the case. Ogre is also okay, though, because it can be used as an offensive card, sometimes as the breaker. Playing through cards like IP Mascarena, uh, SP Little Knight, and Appalooza, if it wasn't made with IP Mascarena, which is going to, I think, happen more often with the Fiendsmith line or Selene line as Apo, not just the uh, old Apo line with IP. But then when Ogre is paired with Hand Traps is when you can really start to see it get a lot more powerful. Uh, and that's where this card has some validity. Again, like Nibiru, we're trying to get it to the paired with stuff. Now, if you're going to compare uh, Ogre versus Nib to pair stuff with, Ogre is for sure weaker. It is one worse by itself. Uh, and when you do resolve a pair off with it, it is not as powerful. But for example, if they go like original special from deck to get their Snake High line while they have an Apple in the field and you go Ash, the Apple, and you Ogre it, that's still fantastic. Uh, and there will be plenty of games like that. So the card is powerful. Uh, and I guess the only up upside that it has over Nibiru is again, as a breaker uh, position, it can be drawn as a sixth card sometimes to get there or even held when you get into these weird funky game states. It also means that you can draw two of it, and it's not nearly as dead as drawing, say, two Veilers, two Ash, two Nibirus. The only thing that really kind of competes with that is Imperm. A Ghost Mourner is another one that is decent. But remember how we talked about last format. It is a clear step down from cards like Imperm and Veiler. And if you're making a choice between which of the three or which two of the three you want to play, it is no doubt not Mourner you want to play. It is worse because it can't Snake Eye Ash, and therefore zero chance of ending their turn immediately on that play. Now, there is some times where they lead which uh, Mourner will stop them more often and you can't stop them. However, remember, uh, now that Snake Eyes can just normal summon a hand trap and then make the Fiends into the plays, it gets a bit dicier. So yeah, the card is just fine. But if you need more hand traps, it, it exists. And the last hand trap I have on this position is not Joel Nockbird. It is actually Dominus Purge. Uh, and I guess it really shouldn't be that surprising. I think Dominus Purge should be played as the uh, next hand trap after the best four or five in any hand trap deck, assuming you can play it. Dominus Purge is overhyped. It is another hand trap. That's great. It is a weaker, but albeit similar version to Ash Blossom, which great. The game needs more hand traps sometimes. I think it's a weird, weird case right now where we're in such a hand trappy format, but I think there'll be a lot of times where this card can be played and just won't be played because relative power level, this card isn't that crazy. It is just clearly worse than Ash with way more restrictions. That being said, uh, if your deck can use it and being in a hand trap required format, it is a solid hand trap to add. So yep. Yeah. Nothing else to it. Let's move on to what are the best side staple hand traps? Well, um, it's just one, and I think it's uh is it obvious? I've been shit talking this card, but I think it is actually fine in this format, and that is Molt Chummy Parolia. Because against most decks, this is not bad. It's Pot Agreed going second, which not brilliant, ooh, but when you're needing more hand traps to play, this draws more hand traps. If you're playing a breaker deck, you probably don't have that many breakers in your deck, and the two cards you draw off this may not draw you into a breaker. At which point you should probably decide more breakers uh, to give you a higher chance of drawing them when you when you play versus uh, Snake Eye or, or Ubel or whatever. Uh, but in a hand trap deck where I have a high density hand traps, the two cards I draw off it are oftentimes going to be pretty good. But that being said, I don't think this card is that insane. I, I think people are overhyping it and there will be many formats where this card is unplayable. Uh, I think it just happens to be that it's a, like, a nice pot of greed versus Snake Eye sometimes and uh, it's solid versus Ubel as well as some of the rogue decks. So should be in your side deck. Let's talk with the playable staple hand traps. Drone Lockburn, I think, falls here. Now, I think this card is better in other matchups. For example, I think against Ubel, it is way more effective at curbing their field. Their maximum capacity under Droll is drastically lowered, as well as there are way more times where I feel like the deck can just fold to it, uh, where like, Nightmare Throne can't get the extra ability, or you can't resolve Beckoning Beast or Spirit Gates combos, or you just can't use Nightmare Pain and therefore can't trigger your U-Bells. You have to fuse very awkwardly. You can't always access your Unchained cards effectively. You can't access the trap. Uh, overall makes the board more, more uh, vulnerable to one, use board breakers on. So you can do that even if you're mixing strategies together uh, or uh, hand trap them, which hand trap. So yeah, I think this card is a feasible card to side in versus U-Bell. That being said, I wouldn't side in versus Snake Eye unless again, I need to get lucky. That being said, if it's in your side deck and you're playing versus Snake Eye and you're going first, there is more of a method to it. Uh, if you draw them and you go first, you can back it up with a little bit of other disruption. Then it gets a bit better because it's harder for them to push through it. Other hand traps that are just okay in the side deck. DD Crow, one that is definitely better than it was because of the Fiendsmith cards. If they go Fiendsmith Engraver to get Tractus into Lurry, Crow there is effective. Uh, and we're also seeing people drop Flamebridge to one. Crow and Flamebridge there can now be effective at stopping some bodies, stopping and board pieces from being as good and stopping follow-up. So there is a lot more merit behind Crow now. But that being said, it is probably in most cases weaker than Bistral, I feel like. It is also uh, very meh in grind games. 
and it's only okay to pair. I think it's worse than a Bistral. So my current opinion on this is that I'd rather play Bistrals in most cases. However, this card does have other coverage versus decks like Tenpai. So if you're playing a, a, a side deck hand trap and you want a little more to put in for Snake Eyes, um, but you also want to have the dual coverage of a card to side out your like your Veilers for against Tenpai, this card is fine. Uh, and I think it may give you a bit more coverage while still giving you more hand traps uh, against good old Snake Eyes. Next up, we got the Cyframe Package, Gamma and Delta. Uh, Delta can be paired okay because it can help you push through cards that cross out. Lullaby, Talents, Hitting Original, or Divine Temple are also okay, but it's not fantastic. Um, it's a very meh hand trap, and if you want to layer more hand traps on, you can do that. However, it's going to take up more spots. You have the Brick in the deck, and if you enter a grind game, this card is just dead. Uh, now, other cards can be like that too, like Moltrum is an example, but I feel like if you're comparing Moltrum to Delta, I'd rather draw Moltrum me almost every time. Another hand trap that I think is solid is Phantasme. Uh, this card is just budget multi chummy because it draws the cards a bit later on. But if the goal is to pair hand traps together, then it does fine. Uh, as well as it gives you more bodies. And again, we talked about how the bodies are more effective now than they were before. So I do think that the Phantasme is a solid choice. It is also good in decks that don't play hand traps. Uh, Phantasme has been one of my go-to choices for any breaker deck or deck that just doesn't want to play hand traps like an Elaborate deck because it lets you sculpt your hand in a way to break boards. And the bodies can still be helpful in other decks as well, being kind of a pain in the ass to deal with. Overall, I think Phantasme is in a very solid spot. That being said, it shouldn't be in every side deck, but I think there will be a fair number of side decks where this card finds its place in pretty comfortably. Now, there is one last hand trap to talk about as being playable, uh, and it's not what you think it is. It's Vados. It's weird. Hitting something like Divine Temple of Snake Eye is not bad at all, and then you can combo this with, like, Nibiru or uh, a way to pressure to kill it, and you have, a, like, a nuke on their field, which is... Kind of cool. It also gives you a lot of ways to out cards like Sangin Summoning, a card that is broken, or the Giving Puppet Field Spell, or even Nightmare Throne. Every deck has field spells, and Vados can be solid. I personally don't think I'd play it, but I feel like it was worth mentioning because I don't think the card is as bad as it seems, and I'm very curious just to see if there will be meta games where it pops up, and if field spells get a little bit more important and a little bit better, then that's when we start seeing it being a side deck or even main deck. Who knows? A very cool card. That leaves the rest of the hand trap being poor choices. Uh, that includes Bell, a card that is graveyard hitting. While yes, you can hit stuff like Sequentia, I feel like it is way more limited in what it can hand trap, but also can't be used to put bodies in the field the same way Bestials can, and then also can't be used to hit the resource game. Like you can't Bell the, the engraver and then it just be gone, or uh, like Crowing or Bestialing a Sequentia sometimes can turn off the capacity of Fainsmith for the rest of the game. So Bell, I think, should be phased out of people's deck almost entirely right now. While the card was on the uptick before, it is now, I think, pretty much relevant, so keep it out of your deck. All hand traps that are now worth considering. Uh, Contact C, Retaliating C, Skullmeister, same, similar reasons. Our Retaliating C is cool if you want cards from Melodious or Despia, I guess, but they're not fantastic, and I think you can just kind of be better off without them, so don't play it. There's surely better cards in those matchups. Sideframe Epsilon, who cares? I think Ghost Tree for Winter Sherry, as we can talk about for a second, there's just so many broken uh, cards, though, in Extra Decks. I don't know what you'd hit. And you can argue maybe hitting IP hits enough of the uh, interaction that it's worthwhile. But most extra decks are like a couple cards going second, a couple cards going first, and a bunch of different extenders. And unless there's really one card that is part of their setup that's crucial against your deck, Reaper just won't have a spot. It's a card I tried a lot months ago. I feel like it's actually gone more powerful in Reaper than just this is not. It's just not good. So those are all the hand traps and how I'd evaluate them in this metagame. And I think that is the most important part about the analysis for uh, this format. A lot of the other stuff is less important, but I will talk about other strong side deck cards uh, and board breakers because they will play a part in the format. Uh, and even though I would say your tournament experience at the NA and Euro WCQs are going to be dominated by hand traps, that's not all you're going to face against. So let's talk about it. Before I move on to the next section of the tier list, if you're enjoying what you're seeing and want to support the channel in an extra way, please go check out the Patreon where you can sign up to get access to some exclusive content, specifically more meta-oriented stuff like this. And if you want to go the step further, you can also sign up for the classrooms, where I'm going to be holding before the EWCQ and any WCQs, respectively, to go over some of the more intricate things in the format, as well as offering a Q&A session for you to pick my brain directly. The link will be down below. So if you want to go check it out, it'll be right there. But anyways, let's get back to the video. In terms of board breakers, none of them are going to be the best main deck staples or the best side deck staples. That kind of falls in line with my philosophy that board breakers just aren't where you want to be right now. The cards you want to be as playable main deck staples are cards like Triple Tactics Talents and Forbidden Droplet. I think those are solid because when your opponent has a half field because you weakened them with hand traps, you can still use them to fight through the field in a more effective manner. 
Draw put is a bit weirder for me, and it depends a lot more on the deck because I don't love discarding cards. Value wise, feels bad. Uh, and when you get into a you know resource game versus your opponent hand trapping you, draw put can be ineffective. Talents can also be solid, but also in some matchups you could just draw it dead and not be used when you get impermed, or if your opponent just isn't playing a hand trap deck, which I think will be somewhat common. Uh, not crazy common. I'd say maybe 20% of opponents will play combo decks that don't have a hand traps. That being said, I am fan of cards that are solid going first and second. Otherwise, I think you can get caught off by hand traps. And then if you just have two dead cards in your hand, it can be the difference between winning and losing. And I've seen that as someone who's played Dark Ruler uh, and, their, and their combo decks. And if I had any hand trap of my own to stop their play, I could have, you know, won. But I have a Dark Ruler and therefore just get steamrolled. That being said, I think if you want to lean more and more into the hand trap approach, Dark Ruler is an okay option. I wouldn't put too many cards in that are bad going first uh, because it can really clog you up. But... If you want to put in cards that are good going second, uh, like and can solo by themselves, Dark Ruler is one of the best. Uh, if you back it up with some engine, you can push through a lot of fields. Uh, the only other card I feel it can do that, and that's a card I really hate, so you may never see this as high on this list again, and that is evenly matched. It just so happens that a lot of the Snake Eye boards, unless they end on Desi Ray, don't really have a great way of dealing with this. It also hits the grind game, which is kind of nice, because if they don't keep the Flame Burns, then they kind of just don't have much. Uh, that being said, if they choose to keep like Appaloosa, if your deck struggles with Appaloosa, then this card will still be a problem. So on a thing like Ubel, I choose not to play evenly. Uh, however, if your deck has more problem with like the IP SP setup and the removal stuff, then evenly is fantastic. The biggest thing here is you're going to be giving up your battle phase. And same with Dark Wars. Both these cards should be relegated to decks that can effectively shut off the Snake Eye follow-up. You either have to put up Floodgates, MTK your opponents, or rip apart their graveyard. The Melodies can do this with cards like Bloom, which will banish three from the grave. Or Despia will give a puppet lock you. Or Yubel will put up such a strong bloody field that you just can't do shit. So yeah, um, <laughs> that is kind of what you have to do if you want to play these cards, but they do have some efficacy in the matter. And if that's what you're going for, you will be playing these in the main deck likely. So the only other board breaker-ish card that I feel like has enough merit for you to mention as a main deck staple, but I really don't like, it's on the teetering edge of being pushed out to, to pour is Book of Eclipse. A card I think is not that good because there are some Omni Negates now with Desiree. However, again, this card has the duality of being usable going first or second. And there are some times uh, where this can shut off enough enough negates to where, or enough interrupts that you can push through a field, especially when paired with other breakers. So this should be lower on the list in, of breakers domain. But if you have space for enough breakers that you want to keep adding more and more, Eclipse is okay in that position. Another card teetering on the edge there is Forbidden Chalice. Again, you can see me valuing the cards that go for second here uh, a lot higher than other board breakers, unless I think they're really phenomenal. And Chalicing Edge, to be able to use it going for a second is important. So yeah, that's kind of the reason why it's there. So let's talk about some of the more playable side deck staples that are board breakers now. Now, I think some of the obvious ones are going to be Duster and Lightning Storm. I think these cards aren't staple because they're not going to excel specifically in any matchups. They're okay in a lot of them. And when you pair them with cards, they can be pretty good in several matchups like Snake Eye. Over by themselves, they're never going to be enough. Uh, and they don't cover an extreme amount of cards or decks that they are really worth it. That being said, if people are on the skill drain uh, bandwagon, uh, then you will want some sort of back removal and this card could be okay, especially if you're hitting on multiple cards like Temple at the same time, or just if you want some back removal over stun. Although obviously, like unless you're skill drain in the field, this will just get protected by Hugin. Now, another backer option that is, I think, a little more justifiable in, in a lot of decks is Pankratops. Uh, not being able to clear everything is a problem. However, this card can be used to clear several different threats. Being used in the battle phase as well to threaten cards like Appaloosa or IP can be good. But then its biggest straw is that it can add something like a skill drain. In grind games, this card can be insane because it can threaten, obviously, the body while being an interrupt. And then also, if the body and interrupt isn't super useful, you can turn it into your Beansmith cards. Yeah, they keep coming back. So I think it'll be uh, cool to see how much it gets played. Now, the last board break I want to talk about in terms of playability is Metal Tronus. This one is weird because it has duality for going first or second, and I'm a big fan of that because as my side deck feels to be extremely tight right now, because I want a lot of cards to put in from going second and going first to cover my bases, Metal Tronus is nice because I feel like in my matchups is good going first and second. I think this card is underappreciated in how effective it is versus Fiendsmith. Now we've seen what it does versus Ubel, and it has applicability versus Appaloosa, cards like IP, because uh, you can, you know, summon their own, like summon those exact copies, or then turn them into uh, Zalantis. But against Ubel, you can target Unchained Solo Rage and then summon any 1800 Attack Fiend Dark. So, what do you pick? Spoiler alert, it's 1800 Attack Fiend. Oh, what's that? Fiendsmith the Engraver. Then you can just do Fiendsmith stuff. So, not only did you negate one of their best cards, you summoned one of the crazy extenders. Um, so, yeah, very, very powerful. All right, so next let's talk about some of the poor choices for board breakers, whether it be the main or side. And then a cards that steal your opponent's board, like Change a Heart, 
Snatch Deal, and Mind Control. Now, why I don't like these cards is because they're not good going first. So for one, in Hand Trap Wars, they can be ineffective. But also, when you go second, they're not guaranteed to work. For one, we're seeing a lot more Omni Negates. I mean, just Desi Ray, but we are seeing uh, Varadris for New Bell. But also with Fiendsmith and Beach's combos being ingrained into the metagame a little more, there are a lot more pseudo FTKs. Now, in a Hand Trap format, those tend to be a lot worse. Although they do exist, and I think people will side deck them, especially for more board breaker strategies. This is also kind of to the detriment of uh, normal spells like Dark Ruler and Evenly, but I kept them in anyways. Now, if you can pull off something like Change of Heart on Appaloosa, then fantastic. That's pretty good. However, it's not going to end the game by itself, so I don't think it'll be as impactful as say Dark Ruler Evenly. And yeah, I mean, it just ultimately means that it's probably not worth the spot. But if you really want to include more breakers, I guess these are next in line. Interestingly, alongside that, there are three quick play spell that could be interpreted as breakers as well. Book of Moon is one where I feel like it is just strictly worse than Book of Eclipse. It's not going to be live. And when there's a Desiree up, it doesn't even force the Desiree because when it's equipped with the Sequentia, you can't even target it. So it's not really going to cover as many bases. When you go first, it also does less at stopping tempo. It is only the single removal spot, which is fine, but this is just so much better. I could play Daruma Cannon or Eclipse, which just far exceeds it. So it's just very much weighs low, low, low quality uh, interrupts. And the same bandwagon is Super Polymerization, a card which I feel like is just never alive. And with so many broken extra deck cards right now, and the Fiendsmith's really taking up even more spots, how the hell do you have space in the extra deck for cards like Garuda and Mudragon, which are going to be a necessity to make this card playable? Now, probably the best way to use this is on IP and Appalooza, if you can make the Earthquake Magnister, but again, that's just even more spots than the extra, so I, I just can't see this card ever being the correct option. Uh, now, there is the one case I like this is when you go first, but if I'm looking for trap cards, there are better options, so pass. Last one is enemy controller. Yeah, enemy controller is a way run because I thought this card was better for the longest time. But the thing is, in grind games and value-based games, e contributing a monster is just too much to pay, I feel like. It's not going to be nearly enough to break boards. And the only upside is that sometimes it forces through impermanent veiler type cards while trading up. While it's okay right now, I don't think it's enough. Now the other breakers that fall into the poor choice section shouldn't be a surprise. It's cards that are not quick play spells that fall to the same issues as cards like Dark Willer Change of Heart. Are also bad going first and just don't do enough so dark hole nope not cutting it regaki same thing herald of the abyss no towers in the format pass yamasio and other kaijis god no avagolem like sphere mode ugh, like these are all just incredible costs to pay now sphere mode and avagolem can see play in specifically decks that don't need normal summons and uh don't like any hand traps so renuk stun and labyrinth Harikara. terrible Oh, this is a surprising one. Fenrir. Uh, I think Fenrir is a cool card. And people often like it because it has the dual purpose of being solid going first and solid going second. However, it is just not really effective enough at doing either. I think, in fact, it is better going first because when you get into Hand Trap Wars is when Fian Fenrir can be brutal. And it is a body towards Fiendsmith lines. At which point, let's lean in and just play the whole cash to your package. I think Fenrir just isn't where I want it to be right now. And... Uh, I wouldn't play it unless I'm playing a full on cash share package, at which point the highlight of the deck is Unicorn, not Fender. Okay, so I think that covers all of the board breakers. Let's talk about some of the best going first cards now. So again, none of these are going to fit into the best mainnick staples, and this is for an obvious reason, a card that is not good going second is probably not going to find your spot in the main deck, at least it shouldn't. Now, one on the list, drum roll please, Skill Drain. So yeah, this one is one that I probably wouldn't have put so high in the past, but I've come around on it. I think this card does a little more than cross out in a lot of cases, especially as you broaden now to a bit more breaker decks, and I expect maybe a little more tempi. So at least right now, I'm preferring skill drain a little more. That being said, the difference between cross out is small. Those two are like the best going first cards, cross out skill drain. They just cancel out so much. And cross out, when they don't hand trap you, you want to hold it for uh, their engine. But if you're not playing a mirror, it can be worse. Whereas Skill Drain is just insane, insane, like almost every time. Another one to talk about is Rivalry of the Warlords, a card I feel like people haven't given enough credit because you can play it in Snake Eye. Uh, and now I may sound a bit crazy saying that, but again, this one was one of my ideas that I proposed because yeah, you can just send it off of Snake Eye Ash to turn it off. And in fact, it's partially better than Skill Drain in some of these situations because there's less they can do to play into it. But also, your Snake Eye Ash isn't negated. So if they summon it and they have like the Ash Blossom to stop the Send effect, you're still going to use the On Summon effect to get Poplar to get Templar Original. So you still have your plays rolling and you have more at your disposal once you sack off the rivalry. 
That being said, it, it does have less matchup coverage now. Specifically, versus you battle, you're going to have way less options. Skill Drain is a solid card versus that deck. Same with Tenpai. So Rivalry is worse in those matchups. That being said, I think in the context of using it versus Snake Eye, people haven't really utilized its potential in the mirror match because at the end of the day, the reason Skill Drain is so broken in, in Snake Eye is because even if your deck is weak to it, you can just send it off. It's like sending off Vanity's Emptiness in the old Dragon Blue deck. You control it. You choose what you want to do with it. And I think that dynamic of Floodgates is so stupid. And it's why Emptiness got banned. And yeah, I don't want to get into the rants about this crap because I feel like everyone's been complaining about it for six months now. So that kind of wraps up most of my best side deck staples. Now, there's one I forgot to mention because I wasn't sure how I went to classify it. The last best side deck staple is Cosmic Cyclone. Then it's because if you want something for back row, it is probably the best option. Versus Rooney Stun, which is a deck I do expect to play against some amount. Cosmic Cyclone can hit through Hugin, which is important for stuff like Tyrant's Tirade. A card that is probably going to be in the deck list, as well as cards like Rivalry, Chosen, uh, Hitting Fountain, also fantastic. And when you go first with it, it can be used very defensively. You can hit cards like Number Throne, Number Pain, and Spirit Gates. Solid Resume Belt, Solid Trap. Cosmic has many applications going first. And I think when you're pressed for space in your side deck, for a lot of the stuff that's not as pressingly important, like, say, Early or Runic Stun, having cards that have dual purposes is where you want to be. So let's talk about the playable main deck staples that would be good going first. Now, there's only really one card and it does have applications going second, and that is Call by the Grave. The card is fine right now. I don't love it. It does hit hand traps unless you push through sometimes. That being said, the best hand traps are like Imperm and Nibiru, which this card does nothing against. It's also only just okay at breaking the fields, really just princess it prevents, and then hand traps, of course. So it's just meh in a lot of cases. Now, if you want to wait, push through hand traps, then other cards are just better. But it does have a solid matchup spread and can be used defensively as well, where if you don't use it as a way to stop hand traps, it's a solid trap card, being a way to stop graveyard effects or just shut off anything that requires the graveyard. Uh, I think it is just an understandable card to main deck, but it's not going to be like top of the list to just to slot in my deck. Next, we're going to talk about some of the playable side deck staples that are going first. The biggest one I'm looking at in the context of Snake Eyes, if I'm playing Snake Eyes, is Lullaby of Obedience. Its matchup spread leaves a little bit to be desired, and that is kind of what concerns me the most, especially if I expect some new Bell players at the WCQ. But it still can be used for the Fiendsmith Engraver. I'll be kind of meh. And it's just overall a high quality card when you get to resolve it as Tarmas and Extenders go. But it's not just the body, it's a body that does something, and that is good. You could also use it in the context of going second if you just want more live cards and you want to reduce redundancy. Example, if you want to take out a third Snake Eye Ash for a Lullaby, that's fine. In the mirror match, that's better than a Snake Eye Ash, right? Because if you're going to draw Ash plus Lullaby, I'd rather that than two Snake Eye Ashes. And if you draw just Lullaby, it could turn into Snake Eye Ash. Wow. Crazy, right? Now, if you'd rather not just push through what your opponent's doing and have actual Floodgates, we've got a couple different ways of going around that. Of course, we got our Lingering Floodgates. And now there's three main ones that I would pick for this format. First one, Different Dimension Ground. This one is solid it's just gonna buy you a turn most likely decks can't do that much into this there's a limit to what they can do through a macrocosmos type effect and you're probably gonna live so you don't need to do much else that being said the biggest problem with this card and with all the other lingering floodgates that stop your opponent for one turn if you don't have follow-up or you get into a resource game versus hand traps it is a neg one and the tempo isn't gonna be as important so it can be hard to justify sometimes and be a bit iffy the two other cards in the department are also rather solid first up is mistaken arrest I mean, yeah, this card is just stop searching. You can see why this is good. The same as draws going first, you can just use this card. But this will come back to your turn. So it is a bit of a problem that you can't do anything to send it off. And I think it is just overall kind of worse than a lot of other stuff. But that being said, if you want to use it, it is fine. And if your deck doesn't overly rely on searching, it's powerful. And your opponent's not going to be able to stop it the same way they can, like, anchor tops a skill drain. You're just dead. And the last card is not going to be effective versus probably the two best decks, Snake Eye or Yubel. That is Dimensional Barrier, because what's Yu-Gi-Oh! The Dimensional Barrier, of course. This card is more searchable now, thanks to Beatrice. But yeah, I mean, versus decks this card is good against, it is just game ending. Despia, concede. Tempai, concede. Pearly, concede. It's just, it's brutal. Like, I hate this card so much. I shouldn't have to explain more than that, because I feel like I explain it every single time. We have a tier list. Next. So let's talk about, then, what continuous floodgates are just okay. Well, if your deck can run... Dimensional Fissure, I think that one is a solid option. This one actually has some applications for breaking fields if you can pair it along with some other cards, stopping some hand traps, as well as making a lot of their plays less efficient. But when you go first with this card, it's solid cards like Valor, cards like Ogre, if there's good against you, 
as well as they're going to hit their ability to play, their ability to follow up, uh, hits the Phoenix with cards. So I think it is a solid choice. The card is not perfect and it will not solo games by itself, but as long as you can back it up with a little bit something, something, it should be pretty solid. And uh, yeah, I think it's a good card. We also got Deck Lockdown, a card that I don't love, but I know a lot of people do. And I think it has merit, which is why I'll include it on here. It is absolutely insane when you resolve it. But what I don't like about it is it is harder for you to get rid of your, of your own field. This, unlike how Skill Drain, you can send out with Snake Eye Ash. Like the only thing you can prepare Deck Lockdown for is if you're expecting Cross Out for Skill Drain, because I guess I did win uh, the Wisest Indy, but I don't, know, I don't know if that's enough reason to play a card that is just, in, in most cases, unless your deck can't play it, strictly worse than Skill Drain. Uh, I'm uh, not a big deck lockdown proponent, but I understand it. Next up is good old Anti-Spell Fragrance. The thing with this card is that it's not that effective in grind games. And that's my biggest kind of grievance with a lot of cards right now in Floodgates, and I think that's good for the game. Skill Drain and Rivalry can break that kind of boundary because they're just that good at negating and getting immediate value right away, or clearing monsters off the field, and then getting your opponents. And a spell's not going to do that. If you're trying to shut off spells and breakers, this card is obviously fantastic. And if you're trying to buy tempo, this card is good too. But I think that especially because monsters are better now and hand traps are better now, and I spell con doesn't have the same place in the meta that it would have a bit ago. That being said, this card is broken. Please, please don't undersell how good this card is, even if this isn't the format for it. Now, say you don't want floodgates, you want more worried about the value game. What are some other normal trap cards or on in the type of degree where you can just kind of trade one for one and that'll be more effective? Uh, and these playable traps in that scenario are going to be the ruby cannon still in a deck that plays trap cards this is a main deck option for sure because it is far and away the best normal trap card but even a side deck is going first option this card is fine because you can trade for actual value versus link monsters but you can also choose to play for tempo and just book like whatever they summon on the spot and just your entire field is turned off uh, and yeah the ruby cannon is a fantastic card there's not much more to say about it it does kind of everything you're hoping a trap does and stopping your opponent and it has very few weaknesses Another option, though, and I think it's a card that has some merit to Solemn Judgment and Solemn Strike, because when you get to grind games, these can trade one for one for pretty much any card. And if you're hitting a Link Summon, then you're really trading up for value. As well, you start using Strike offensively to play through hand traps if they give you the turn back. So why not vying for the same level tempo or floodgates? You still can't stop your opponent from playing while playing for more of a value game, and that can be very important if your opponent isn't playing it and is behind on cards. That being said, when versus the Breaker deck, these are absolutely worse, and while they can be good, when you get like evenly matched and you have a strike face down, you can feel like a bit of a doofus. This one of the card that fits into this trap role that's a bit weird for me to define this Black Goat Laughs. And it's particularly has more validity now than it did in any other format is because Beatrice can be in pretty much anybody's deck. And I guess in the same vein, you can include cards like Keldon Medora. The fact that there's like a bit of a reason to main deck them in some ways. If you want to play on breakers and not leave all your interrupts layered on the field to put them, some of them in the grave or in the hand to kind of give you that bit of a dynamic, and these are one card packages that can accomplish similar things. Now this is more post side for me because for one, it is still a brick and it's not great going first, uh, but it is one less side deck spot. And sometimes this can be enough to offset the breakers. Because now if you get Dark Willard, you're still gonna have like the Temple for IP, you're still gonna have Princess, and you're still gonna have either the Graveyard Removal via the Keldon Medora, or you're gonna have the Effect Negation with Black Goat Laughs. That's pretty solid. Oh yeah, I think like Black Goat is for sure a card worth considering if you want to just give yourself a bit of alternative versus these wards. And I think that pretty much covers every single playable main deck and side deck card, as well as the best options for each. Some of the poor options that I've chosen not to include, you'll notice cards like Thrust. Cards I've chosen not to include that are good going first are cards like Gozen Match, where field doesn't cover enough matchups. Simul Archifiends, which was always super bait. B-Wave, because I, I, don't, I don't get the point of this card. You're getting a hand trap anyways. Or cards like Threatening War, because this card just... I don't want to explain it again. This card sucks. Wave of the Super Ancient Organisms, because it has poor matchup spread. Power Sink Stone, because the card can be used against you. Spellbound, which is just weaker than Knee Barrier or other tempo cards. And the Room Ganon. There are a bunch of cards that aren't super effective right now. So that leaves what I mentioned before as being the actual best and playable main deck and side deck cards. Now, if you have any thoughts of your own, please leave them down below if I made a mistake in my assessments or if I missed a card altogether that deserves talking about, then this is the forum to discuss it. Over the next two weeks, we'll see how true these are and how the metagame will evolve. I'm curious if anything on this list changes as new things come to light with any WCQ in time for the EWCQ. Maybe I'll talk about it next Monday. And either way, I'll be streaming the EWCQ on Twitch. So make sure to go check that out where we'll be following along all the gameplay. You know what to do, smash the like button. Let me know that's worthwhile doing these. And come back next time. Otherwise, we'll stay tuned. Peace.